Today I invite you into a myth. And a myth is a powerful tool to convey a universal truth. Today I want to share with you a myth. There's a story I heard, a mythical story I heard, about a young man who was born to a free family. And his father had encouraged him to learn a skill, to learn a trade, to go to university, to make something of himself. This man was born into ancient Persia, and he decided that he liked the finer things of life, but necessarily he was not interested in working hard for them. He wanted those things to just come to him. He wanted to enjoy the better things of life, the finest food, the finest clothes, the finest wine, but he did not want to work. And so over time, he met up with some like-minded people and entered into a life filled with crime. He was apprehended. And once he was apprehended, he wasn't put in jail. No. He was taken to the market a few towns away and sold into slavery. The man who bought him had a household. And the matriarch of the household said, you know, I need somebody to tend to the horses. So maybe we could train the slave to be our horse tender. So after some time, he befriended the matriarch. And he told her, you know, I'm not really a slave. I'm not like the rest of them. I was born into a free family. I made some bad decisions and I was placed into slavery. But I'm not like the rest of the rest of your slaves. And she looked at him and smiled and said, but why dear, you have the mind of a slave. Your decisions have landed you just where, just where you should be. Because you have the mind of a slave. I think that's an interesting concept that a person could be free but still be enslaved in his or her mind. I wonder if you've ever met anyone who had the mind of a slave. And I wonder what that mind of a slave would look like. How would it manifest itself? In our gospel today, in the 22nd chapter of Matthew, I hear Jesus communicating something to us. Perhaps Jesus is trying to emancipate us from mental slavery. Perhaps Jesus is trying to free our minds by letting us know who we are. In the 22nd chapter of Matthew, we find that Jesus had three tasks. His first test was when the Herodians and the disciples of the Pharisees came to him and tried to trick him. He tried, they tried to test Jesus by tricking Jesus. They said, Jesus, there has to be a fallacy in your theology. There's got to be a fallacy in your politics. They said, Jesus, should we pay taxes to the emperor? Now this was a trick question. Because he was darned if he did and darned if he didn't. You see, the Jews hated the fact that they were oppressed by the Romans. They hated the fact that they had a coin that had the emperor's face on it. And they had to use that coin to do any kind of trade. They hated that. And they had, you know what they hated the most? that the emperor said that he was the son of God. This violated everything that they held dear. This, this violated their self-identity. And so every Jew hated paying taxes. But if he had said that, he would have been an insurrectionist. He would have been a revolutionary. If to say that in public meant certain death for Jesus, right then and there. And so Jesus said, look at that coin. 
That's the emperor's face on it, isn't it? Well, give to, to the emperor what belongs to the emperor. And give to God what belongs to God. That was Jesus' first test. His second test came from the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection at all. They, they didn't believe in this at all. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees didn't. And so they tried to trick Jesus. They tried to set him up for another logical fallacy. They said, you know, if a man had a wife and he died, by the, according to the law, his brother had to marry her on his behalf and take care of her. And they said, what if this went on brother after brother after brother after brother? Whose wife would she be then? And Jesus challenged me, look, he said, you know, you have to elevate your mind. You've got to really understand scripture. That's not what the resurrection is about. That's not what the afterlife is like. In the afterlife, all of our passion and all of our existence is tied and we become one with God. But this scripture today, we find something a little bit different. See, the Pharisees came to Jesus this time, in his third and his final test, as, as scripture tells us. They came to Jesus and they said, okay, Jesus, we're experts at the law, and my friend here is the expert in the law. Here's your challenge. We have all these commandments. Which one of the commandments is the greatest? What Jesus did in that moment was to shift our entire perspective. This is very nuanced. A lot of times when we hold conversations with each other, we talk about what it is. Like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I did. We never necessarily talk about why. We go from what to how we did it, and maybe we talk about why we do it. But Jesus shifted the mindset. You see, there's something about that mindset. Look at how they're operating. They're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to, they're trying to use their relationship with God as this heavy, oppressive thing. But Jesus said something totally different. He said, the first command and the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all of your soul, with all of your heart, and with all of your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second one is related to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, when you deal with folk who have been oppressed, who have been enslaved, it's very easy, pay attention to this, it's very easy for them to want to oppress each other. It's very easy for them to want to lord over each other. It's very easy for them to want to put each other down. So Jesus took the what should you do and turned it into why you should do it. Why should, why do any of these commandments matter? Why do we care about any of this? Is it the build of hierarchies to say who's better, who's more holy? Jesus said the first thing you need to do is to love the Lord your God with all of your soul and all of your heart and all of your mind. This is the greatest commandment. Once you do that, it is easy to love your neighbor as yourself. And let me say this. Love your neighbor as well as love yourself. Because once you've been oppressed and once you've been enslaved, it's easy to turn in on yourself, isn't it? It's easy to blame yourself. And once you treat yourself bad, of course I'm going to treat the next person bad. They say that, they say that great communicators begin with the question why, not the question what. And I think that's very important when you're dealing with folks that have been enslaved. Jesus was talking to people who had been enslaved in Egypt. And then they were exiled to Babylon. And then 
They had to deal with the Syrians and beg for their ability to come back. And then they were conquered by the Greeks. And then in that moment, they were being oppressed by the Romans. Could you understand what that could do to a person's mind? That God delivered me out of oppression, but I've been oppressed time and time and time and time again. What could that do to a person's psyche, to a person's confidence, to a person's view of oneself? They tell me that in a laboratory situation when psychologists want to induce <coughs> symptoms of depression in an animal, what they do is they, they, get a, they get a dog and they put a harness on, they put a yoke on. And in that yoke, and in that harness, the dog can't sleep, the dog can't eat, the dog can't do anything for itself. And the dog becomes depressed. The dog is like, well, what's the point of all of this? I have no control of my life. That's what oppression does. It, it breaks your will. And that's who Jesus was talking to. He was talking to folks who had, had their will broken. That's why he didn't answer the what question. What commandment is the greatest? He answered the why commandment, the why question. Let me tell you what I did. I got up here in this pulpit some months ago, and I made a what statement. I said, what we gonna do? I said, you know what we gonna do? We gonna have 300 people in church every Sunday. I said, I said, what we gonna do? But I forgot to say why we even need to do it. I'm gonna tell you why we need to do it. We have to tell the world our story. Brothers and sisters, we have to tell the world our story. That is why we have to do it. Here's our story. Our home is on 15th and P. But our family extends around the world. We are followers of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are part of the worldwide Anglican communion and traces our heritage to the beginnings of Christianity. Through the grace of God, which is transcribed and wrote the King James Bible. We strive to love our neighbors as ourselves, and we, we respect the dignity of every person. Our liberty retains this historic structure with rich traditions. We believe in the ordination of women. Since 1874, we have seen 40 African American bishops. Our founding director was born during the chattel slavery era, but was educated in England and started churches in Africa. Then he went on to found St. Luke's Episcopal Church in 1873. This parish was built by men and women who had been previously enslaved. A church was given to us that was funded by the majority population, and this church was rejected so that we could build our own institution. From that moment on, we have always had beautiful, soul-stirring worship services. We built a school to educate children. We built a home for widows. We help to house the homeless. We feed the hungry. We provide shelter for the soul. For 140 years, we have been catalysts for spiritual growth and advocates for social justice. All are welcome here. We are St. Luke's Episcopal Church. That's why we do this. That is why we are here. That is our why. Could you imagine the mindset of a person who had been enslaved and was given a church and rejected it to have his and her own institution. 
how could they have even conceived of something like that? How could they have had that level of self-determination that I am going to work and I'm going to contribute back to this community so we can have our own stuff, we can build our own institutions, and we can set our own destiny? That's who we are. That is why we do what we do. And that's why we have been doing it for 140 years. I think that sometime before that 140 year, that somebody turned to the 22nd chapter of Matthew and they wrote, they read this scripture. They read this good news of Jesus Christ. That it's not necessarily just about what you're doing, but it's why you do it that matters. Why you do what you do. There's a difference between slavery and freedom. It is a difference between taking off the shackles of your mind and living into the liberation that Jesus Christ provides all of us. They asked Jesus a what question? What commandment is the greatest? And he answered a why question. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said something that had it really in the conversation. All the prophets and all the law are built on this. You bang all the law and all the prophets on this statement. That is the why question. And when you understand why and you live into the why, the what is easy. You understand prophecy totally different. You understand the law totally different. Brothers and sisters, that is the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, let it be known that Jesus changes our questions. Jesus changes the conversation from what to why. Let it be known that Jesus will free you from any shame and embarrassment or any pain. Let it be known that Jesus is a way to release you from all of your burdens and all of your heaviness. Let it be known today that Jesus stops you from having to prove stuff to folk. Jesus comes into your brokenness and heals you. Amen.